Introduction to the Diary of a Dead Officer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Diary of a Dead Officer by Arthur Graham West. Introduction. Arthur Graham West was born in September 1891. The first few years of his life were spent in the country, but before he was ten years old his people moved to London, where they settled in Highgate, Graham being sent to the Highgate School. At the age of fourteen he went to Blundell's School at Tiverton with a scholarship. His school days were not particularly happy. He was at that time too shy and retiring to impose himself in any marked degree on his contemporaries, and his complete ineptitude at any kind of game. I have never seen a man so demonstrably and obviously unathletic. Meant that at best he would figure very much in the background, in a community where skill at games was the only passport to popularity and the only measure of worth. But worse than this, West was clever. At least he was concerned with books. He was also a naturalist and concerned with bugs. His study used to crawl with caterpillars, and at that time smelt badly. These two tastes combined to damn him as a public schoolboy. Blundell's had one universal designation for anyone who regarded books as something other than work and work as something other than an unpleasant method of wasting boring tracts of time compulsorily inserted in an otherwise interesting existence. This designation was Worm. West was a worm, and there was no more to be said. Being a worm at Blundell's meant that no one thought of asking your opinion on any matter of importance and no one went out with you except other worms. As regards his taste for caterpillars, this was unusual, even a little unorthodox, and therefore an object always of suspicion, and sometimes of active suppression. At school, then, West was a quiet, effaced sort of individual, alternately bullied by big boys when they wanted to evince their superiority to worms and cajoled when they wanted their exercises done, but on the whole too obscure to be actively disliked. In July 1910, somewhat to the general surprise, West obtained the school scholarship to Balliol College, and went up to Oxford for the first time in the autumn of the same year. At Oxford his personality expanded and developed in a remarkable way. Never in the strict sense of the word a clever man, even by the academic standard he took only a third in mods and a second in greats, and worked hard for them too, he became an extraordinarily well-educated one. His passion for literature was intense. He was one of those rare individuals who actually liked reading the really great men. It is always something of a shock to find a man reading Milton and Spencer, Homer and Lucretius, Shakespeare and Chaucer, for fun. But West read them all, and liked them. It was all of a piece with his discriminating literary judgment that he disliked Virgil intensely. His reading, especially in poetry, was wide, and it was always somehow hitched on to his life. It was not so much that he continually bored you by quoting, as that his comments on people and things always might have been quotations, and weren't. He caught at once the style and spirit of the writer he reverenced at the moment, and in his conversation could not help unconsciously reflecting it. I never met a man who could talk Meredith conversation so well as he could. With all this came an indescribable charm of manner. When people were attracted to West, and as time went on they became more and more attracted, they would have found it difficult to say what it was they liked in him. He had no outstanding qualities to win you. 
he was not pre-eminently witty generous genial or hospitable he knew few anecdotes and never told them perhaps it was more than anything else by all the things that he was not that he charmed he was so devoid of push and advertisement so quiet tranquil and unassuming so eminently companionable and above all such a good listener that though these things did not constitute his charm they went some way to explain it he had a great love for beauty in whatever form it came to him before he left oxford he became a really good judge of most things that attract the eye he knew much of pictures furniture china and would in time have become a connoisseur his early predilection for caterpillars developed into a great liking for the country for spring for autumn and the changing seasons summer however always seemed to him dull i have spoken of him as conspicuously unathletic he was but he was a great walker he prided himself towards the end of his oxford time on his autarkia his self-sufficiency which never became self-complacency and on his lack of dependence upon others he would go off for prodigious walks by himself lasting the whole day through or paddle in a lonely canoe far up the unfrequented upper river he was at least until the war came one of those few people who really liked being alone not so much because other people bored him as because he did not bore himself he was in fact sufficiently valuable to be able to stand his own company but he had none of the more endearing vices he could never master a pipe he never got drunk i am speaking of before the war beer was a closed book to him and so were cards also he had never heard any music he was just coming to music when the war took him when the war broke out it left him for some little time untouched he had got so detached from the world he scarcely ever read a paper that it took some time for the war to shake him back into it he went back to oxford for the autumn of nineteen fourteen his fifth year with the intention of reading english literature he found that all his friends had gone and that his boasted autarkia had forsaken him oxford was buzzing like a great hive with war preparations and his poem the owl abashed shows how even at oxford the spell began to weave itself around him in the christmas vacation the infection took him he applied for a commission in a rush of enthusiasm was turned down for his eyes and enlisted as a private in the public schools battalion from that time until his death in april nineteen seventeen his life was a succession of training in england and trenches in france with short intervals of leave in november nineteen fifteen he crossed to france thence to the front in four months he was home again and on his way to scotland where he was trained for an officer until august nineteen sixteen when he had a few weeks leave preparatory to going to the front most of this leave was spent at box hill in surrey and it was there that the complete change of attitude to the war described in part three of the diary took place in september nineteen sixteen he went to france with a commission and was out there continuously until his death it is difficult to describe with any exactness the effect of the army on a man like west nor is it very necessary to do so for the extracts speak for themselves a few things however must be said west joined the army from a feeling of duty and in the best sense of the word of patriotism violence of any kind was abhorrent to his nature he was one of that numerous body of schoolboys who had never had a fight and he hardly ever quarrelled in the words of an old lady who knew him well mr west wouldn't hurt a fly 
West enlisted then, convinced of the rightness of his cause, feeling it his duty to help his country, but disliking as intensely as any man that ever put on khaki the work he had set out to do. This feeling of hatred for violence rarely comes out in the diary. It was always there, but somehow it was taken so much for granted even by himself that it rarely finds expression, save perhaps in the general longing for peace that comes to every soldier. The intense abhorrence of army life which inspires almost every line of part two of the diary sprang from a different cause. West was a man of marked individuality and keen susceptibilities. He had a highly trained mind, and more than that he had a habit of independent thinking. He was an individualist who hated routine and system as devices for suppressing men's differences and reducing them to a common standard of thought and behavior, and distrusted discipline as an instrument for forcing men to do things they disliked. To such a man the army came to seem a thing of evil. It could not reduce him in thought to the dead level of orthodox opinion which alone was recognized and encouraged, and his power of mental detachment and independent thinking, driven underground, turned to gall and bitterness, and found an outlet in the contemptuous and scathing picture of army life presented in Part Two. His leave came in the summer of 1916. The unuttered feelings of dislike and revolt that had been accumulating during the last few months had prepared the way for a change in his intellectual convictions. In part three will be found an account of that change. West became, in brief, a pacifist. A pacifist who was precluded by his position in the army from voicing or acting upon his opinions, save, as he thought, on the certainty of being summarily shot. None of those who saw him that summer, happy in his few weeks' leave and the complete intellectual freedom at Box Hill, suspected the emotional crisis through which he was passing. The bottom was being knocked out of all his beliefs. Religion and patriotism, in the ordinary senses of these words, went by the board, and God became for him a malignant practical joker, or at best an indifferent spectator of the woes of the world. During this time he wrote most of the quasi-philosophical poems that appear in Part Five. Having scrapped the universe in theory, West had to face the problem of his own line of action. As will be seen, his courage failed him, and he went back to the army, believing he did wrong, believing it his duty to stand out, hating and despising himself for proving false to his beliefs. From that time until his death, through all the life of the trenches, through all the scenes of marching and fighting described in Part Four, the war was always, in a sense, irrelevant to him. Something that passed over him not without leaving its traces, not without mattering, but mattering always as a gloomy and sordid background, never occupying the forefront of his mind or interest, never rousing him to enthusiasm, never for a moment appearing to him as anything but sheer cruelty and waste. Even his death was irrelevant. He died, it seems, in no blaze of glory. He died leading no forlorn hope but struck by a chance sniper's bullet as he was leaving his trench. The value of the diary lies in its absolute frankness, its stark realism, its obvious truth and sincerity. As far as possible it is given just as he wrote it, only names and a few details that were too painful or too private for publication being left out. If its detailed realism serves to correct in some measure the highly coloured picture of the soldier's life and thoughts to which the popular press has accustomed us, it will not have been written in vain. C.J. 
End of Introduction